Okay, so now uh, we are live. So um, welcome everyone um, at this next uh, webinar of the ISCB uh, Student Council. Um, today we have a, a great speaker, uh, Dr. Oskun Gokci from the Institute for Stroke and Dementia uh, Research in uh, Munich. Um, and he is going to tell us about uh, the genomic changes that take place in the brain during, for example, aging or uh, in stroke uh, at single cell uh, resolution. Um, so, and before we start, I wanna remind you all that you can follow the ICB Student Council on Twitter um, and that we also regularly do calls for this webinar uh, so that you also can uh, submit your abstracts to be featured here. Um, and so without further ado, I think uh, we will go to uh, Osgood's talk. And well, you shouldn't see me, you should see him, hopefully. And uh, let me see if I. I think can. I'm. I'll Figured stay out. with my slides. Uh, they are prettier than me. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can also uh, look at your slides. Uh, I'll stop in the. Uh, at <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, every, uh, can I start now? Yes, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody can see my slides. Uh, and I'm Özgün Gökçe. I'm a group leader now three and a half year in Munich. Uh, and I want to make this talk more on the, your questions about the career and how the direction of the career goes. And I will give a little sense of what we do. Uh, Myself, I'm a Turkish. I done my PhD in Switzerland in EPFL, worked on a, a micro race. I'm old. Uh, and then I switched to uh, Stanford. I worked three years with Thomas Sudov and three more years with Thomas Sudov and Steve Quick on single cell genomics when it was starting. And since 2016, I'm here. Uh, if you guys are looking for a next position to look, I'll just give a little self-advertisement. I'm looking for a technician, PhD students, and postdocs. So please drop a mail if you are interested and if you are thinking about a career in the uh, genomics. So what I wanted to talk about it, what we do, I wanted to give a sense. We use single cell genomics to understand stroke and dementia. And for that, Single cell genomics really change how we approach the science, how we do analysis, and we can take any cell type or all the cell types and analyze how they respond. And my group's main focus is vasculature in the brain and as well as the neurodegeneration uh, models. And for these models, we are doing uh, shifting mostly onto the immune, immune, uh, immune cell types, but today I will give some examples of the neuronal uh, studies we had done. So why single cell is important? So the unit of life is a cell, and we know the we know there is cell. It's as uh, soon as Hoke invented the microscope. I guess few hours later he looked at an onion and died. Uh, uh, called this small uh, structure he saw as cell. So a technology brought us the microscope and as soon as we know the microscope, we understand there are cells. Later on, Golgi developed the staining, Golgi staining and Kahal produced these beautiful drawings and we understand how diverse the cell types uh, and the neuronal uh, diversity in the brain. And that was due to the technology again, a Golgi staining technology came. And 1960s, we got the flow cytometry and we had a huge immunological blood cell types. Uh, we identify, uh, we improve biological understanding dramatically. Electrophysiology gave us a different neuronal subtypes. And Allen Brain Institute even tried to build a a periodic table of neurons using the morphology and the electrophysiology, but these two parameters are not really good for building, uh, analyzing data mining. What is great is, as you know, 
cells made of proteins. And if we can understand what is each cell's protein composition, we could really classify them perfectly. Unfortunately, proteins are hard to uh, characterize in a single cell resolution, but we have the intermediate, which more or less correlates with the protein is the RNA. And we have really good methods to uh, isolate RNA and amplify that. And last, uh, last 10 years, we have an explosion of the single cell genomics because when I was first entered the field, what we were doing was a general uh, analogy is the smoothie. We put the tissue, all the cell types, mesh it and generate a, a smoothie. And from that, you can understand, is it a good fruit mix or bad? But you never understand which fruit was going bad. It's more like uh, if you wanted to more a better analogy, watching an Avengers movie, you have no clue about any characters. They just mash together or watching a single uh, Hulk movie. So you understand the inner problems of the Hulk. Uh, and single cell genomics, really exploded. This is the single cell genomics papers until 2017. Uh, my paper is around 2016. I My single cell paper came out first. And as you can see, initially few cells, and then in 2017, we started 10x genomics and the uh, explosion started. And this explosion can be seen most effectively number of single cell genomics authors. Here you can see the uh, 10 to the 4 uh, unique authors are added on the single cells by 2020. And seems like this is not going to a plateau. We are increasing use of single cell technologies everywhere. And I just wanted to give you the how we work on this. Uh, we work. One of our pipelines is a um, plate-based pipeline. So what we do is we take the tissue, we dissociate, and then we sort it into the 96 wells, which is, uh, this is a cell sorter that we can identify each cell and locate it into the 384 well plates in here and into the, these wells, we can locate them. And then using uh, microfluidic, uh, the robotics, we amplify this, and prepare a library and send to sequencing and then analyze it. And all this process, each part of the tissue dissociation to sequencing and analyzes is integrated in our group. And here are the people who make it possible actually, Simone uh, Tuberg and Laura. Uh, and we have multiple projects that span from every aspect of the brain. But I wanted to talk today on the striatum, uh, what we had done with the striatal cell types is uh, we isolated the we isolated the mouse striatum and dissociated them. And after this dissociation, we got the all major cell types, as you can see, uh, from neurons to all vascular and other cell types. And next, uh, we classify them into the major subtypes. Uh, I wanted to, in this major subtype classification, we had uh, seen something very interesting, which we called it continuous cell identities. And this continuous cell identities are, as you see here, uh, decrease and can sort the cell types, the discrete cell types into one population. And when we look at this cell type expression, and we saw that this is a spatial location is encoded in that gradient. And when we look this gradient, we can actually quite accurately locate the cell where it's located within the striatum. And using these continuous, this is which not uh, which is not only limited to the dorsal uh, nucleus accumbens, that's the lower part of the striatum to the dorsal part but also interregulations within the striatum, such as matrix, uh, uh, small patches of these red patches, we could identify from single cell data. That is really interesting, which shows you that using single cell genomics data, we can 
reconstitute the complex brain tissue back together. We can assign each neuron where they are coming from, and we can decide the matrix and patch neurons, blue or orange, if they were under uh, which location in the, the stratum we could identify looking to the only the single cell sequencing. Why this is important? Because what I wanted to uh, come to you, uh, share with you is single cell genomics provide your story of at that moment what a cell is doing. So once we identify the each cell cluster here, what you see the neurons, oligodendrocytes, immune cells, within each discrete cell, you can you have enormous amount of information, and we have very lim we are just in the beginning of learning this, um, uh, learning developing tools to distill inform uh, distill each vector. These vectors can be spatial context is our recent publication showed that you can actually put the cells back to the dissociated cells into the uh, brain where they localize. You can identify which cells are in which cell cycle. You can identify even which antibody receptor, uh, antibody repertoire are they expressing. What my group mostly interests uh, our interest shift to, these vectors also define disease associated responses. So the healthy response to disease response, you can dissect that out of these vectors and actually you can even dissect which beneficial uh, responses to detrimental responses. And this type of understanding is changing how we treat diseases. And right now when we having this pandemic, if you look to the initial pro uh, planning genomics and bioinformatics, is the front line of uh, uh, experiments design and information flow. So once we understand how our body, how this virus, which receptors are expressed in which cell types, next, after the disease now, three papers came out about the COVID-19 infection and single cell uh, analysis within the humans, you kind of start to see which cells make the situation worse and which mechanisms actually making it worse. And within a few months, which is crazy actually, since January we know this thing is serious, and now we understand what type of interferon responses, what type of receptors could be used by this uh, virus, and this is only possible by bioinformatic analysis. And when I was trained as a biologist, this would take us probably 15 years. And now we get the same place within three, three months. And that's that's the part that I wanted to share with you is how the single cell transcriptomics is working. And this is the people I would love to thank. And these are the my PhD, my lab with the photos. Uh, as I said, right now we have funding for a technician, a PhD students, and a postdoc. So I don't know my timing right now. I think I'm a little bit quick. Yeah, you definitely have uh, more time if you want to show it. Uh, uh, I can chat more, but I, I thought the science should be a little bit limited, and I would love to get some questions if that's okay. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, so are there any questions you can, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can just uh, type your question into the chat um, and then uh, Osgun can answer them. And also I would love to talk about uh, bioinformatics and the integration. The one, one thing I wanted to talk, actually, uh, this is a little bit unfortunate because I made the presentation in a different computer and I didn't save that. Uh, on my Dropbox, so it is half an hour of work is just, I, I lost few of the slides. What I wanted to talk mostly about the new, uh, the philosophy of our group and how the new biologist has to be shaped, which is uh, in our group, we like this, uh, our PhD students, uh, both include in the wet lab animal experiments to analyze us together. So we integrated the uh, people, both bioinformatic and the research. 
uh, bioinformatic and uh, doing the wet lab parts. And I think this is the next generation because as a bioinformatician, you should understand the weaknesses and strengths of the biological data where it comes from, basic the trash in, trash out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe I can uh, start with a question because what I'm actually always interested in, because you talk about that, um, you know, this can help us understand the disease and maybe treat the disease uh, better. Uh, and of course, this is a bit from the very first gene expression classifiers. This has been the, the ideal, but I also think that actual translation to the clinic, these, these models into different treatment is often uh, lagging behind a bit. Um, Actually, no, I don't really think so. Like the, right now we have incorporated the single cell in the main of the clinical trials and okay. the decisions of this clinical trials shifting uh, immediately on uh, there. Of course, this is not that you find a cell type and, oh, look, this cell type can be targeted by this drug and you start giving that. The process is... 20 30 year old process but now this process has been extremely limited uh, shortened and it is not going to be a single cell only genomics but single cell just makes us make the decisions with much more clarity with much more data so the speed of the clinical trials are increasing dramatically uh, I'm in the basic science part, uh, so the practically we try to understand the disease responses, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my, uh, many of my colleagues right now involved directly embedded in the core of the clinical trials. So they take the drug trials and they check the blood uh, single cell responses, and you see dramatic changes. And similarly, this was actually 2015. We had a uh, single cell analysis of the lung cells and from the human and the blood cells. And initially we didn't know we lost some of the organ transplants uh, patients. And when we look back to the data, we know why they died because they having a wrong type of bacteria and they treated with the wrong antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. you can just go back and right now we are not fast enough to integrate that information, but it's there. Like the, it is, we are there right now. The only problem is we don't have enough people to analyze the data and integrate it fast enough. Mm. Um, thanks. We have a question from Kala. She says, um, that you said it's hard to characterize uh, proteins. So why is it so difficult to apply mass spectrometry approaches to single cell technology? There are actually really good methods to do that. Uh, that the, there is a Texas group labeling technologies and generating uh, uh, signatures of the proteins. But you need to remember, you can't amplify a protein. Like what we are sending the sequencing is nanograms of amplified material. And that is easy to, we have the enzymes to amplify. We, central dogma allows us to amplify RNA to, well, it's not the central dogma, actually, the reverse transcriptase allows us, which breaks the central dogma, RNA back to the DNA, and then we can amplify it millions and millions of fold. So actually RNA and DNA sequencing is not that good. We just have the, mother nature gave us the enzymes to amplify RNA into a DNA and amplify it uh, in millions of fold increase. We don't have a single enzyme that can amplify a protein from a protein. Yeah. yeah. So our problem with the proteomics is not that proteomics is less sensitive. We just don't have the way to amplify a protein. And yes, there are many good methods. There are many, it's the high reaching thing, but it will never compete with the millions of years of evolution of the reverse transcriptase and the DNA polymerase. 
Yes, that is clear. Um, I think that's a, that's a clear answer. Um, let me, this, this question is in two parts. Um, so uh, Joanna asks is that, so, so what she's been wondering is why cerebral vascular diseases and neurodegenerative diseases are always presented as if they are completely different and independent diseases. Um, and she sees that your lab works on both of these. So can you talk about the overlap between them? Uh, so there are no funding agencies listening. That's so I can tell that answer that honestly. The main reason is politics because they are funded by the different agencies. Vascular funding lines are stroke and small vessel disease are funded through different agencies and neurodegeneration is from a different agency. And this, it is kind of a so stupid, I still cannot comprehend that because that creates a different communities, which did creates a different vocabulary and we create different diseases. And it's a beautiful question, uh, which I don't know the answer. I think it is a some territorial lines are drawn between vascular abnormalities and diseases, and also the proteins. This goes into the which protein does what. I don't take protein one function. Proteins are not deterministic tools that people like to think. They are, they fit the situation and in situation, whatever equilibrium directs, they direct. Diseases are much more complicated than, uh, much more complicated than proteins. And for neurodegeneration right now, we are, uh, dementia is a equilibrium between vascular abnormalities, the neuronal abnormalities, and sometimes one leads the other, but in the end, everything crashes together. So the early events, what happening is a big question. And I think the vascular, the neuron, uh, vascular and neuronal components are very much integrated. Yeah, so it's more of a political issue than a uh, different biology here. I don't say that, but I think it is, as biologists, we, before that, like the, I've been trained into the wrong way of biology, and we've been memorized biological terms, biological anatomy, and we didn't learn how to, it is one of the most physical and mathematical science it should be. But we just didn't have the large matrix data. And now we have it, and that's why my group called system neurobiology, because I don't respect these borders. Okay, good. So maybe we can find some overlap. Um, Ushashi has a bit of a general question. She asked, um, do tell us more about how to approach this via single cell genomics. So I guess maybe the specific uh, contribution. That what, 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 again, can you again ask so, the question? Or? So she says, do tell us more about how to approach this via single cell genomics. Um, so the question. Question how we approach the diseases by single cell genomics or the students how approaching, you should approach how the single cell genomics. Uh, that, uh, I mean, maybe uh, she can uh, clarify in chat if she's still uh, with us. In the meantime, Joanna, by the so way. So I can actually take to the, how we approach the diseases. So uh, one of the really interesting cell types I mentioned in the slides is microglia. And right now, Thankfully, the editors will return, but we have a paper in under revision. So in Alzheimer's disease, microglia called disease-associated microglia forms. That's one of the Ido Amit is one of the great is actually if you have time, you should read the papers from Ido Amit and look to the graphs because it's a graphic designer as well. Is he makes the prettiest figures in his papers. Uh, and it says something. It's really easy to get the message when it's pretty. Yeah. Uh, uh, and what Ido identified is disease-associated microglia in Alzheimer's disease models it forms. And our result was, I saw that as a vector. So when disease comes, a vector pull it 
to the cell into a new state. And we wanted to compare with the, what's happening in the aging and we find a third vector, which is uh, the, uh, which is the, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, because my headset was making funny noises. Ah. Uh, uh, so the, basically uh, the second thing is the aging and our research was com combining neurodegeneration microglial single cell and the H single cell uh, signature. And then use this spatial identification, this continuous signatures. And we could pull out the aging vector and the neurodegeneration vector. And the third vector is the homoesthetic, the physiological vector. And when you identify this, what you see is in the aging microglia has all the disease associated responses, but they are distributed in different cells. So no cell try to digest at the extreme rate, release cytokines and start to try to move to cyto uh, cytoskeleton activation at once. One is cytoskeleton, so migrating. One is just uh, phagocytosis and the other one is just uh, digesting after eating. But these clusters upregulate and downregulate in the aging. But in the disease, everything is high. Ah. So that tells you that, that these cells are panicked. And our collaborators and others have done experiments that in neurodegeneration, they eliminate all the microglia. This is 10% of your brain. Like they killed all these cells and you would say the mice didn't like that, but actually they improved. So the, our data suggests that these cells are not, they are panicking too much and they can't deal. It's just like you try to study chemistry, botany and anatomy in the same time. Yeah. It's not functioning. And you can see that with the single cell transcriptomic data because you have the each cell at that time, what are they are doing? When you just put them into the blender, you don't have that information. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's really cool. And you can also see that difference indeed between cells in normal state. You have the different normal mm -hmm. states, uh, but not in disease. Hey, thanks. We have uh, uh, one last question from uh, Gopar, or, yeah, or they have uh, two, two questions actually. Uh, first, is if there are drawbacks to applying single cell RNA sequencing to neural cells compared to other cell types in the body? Um, and how do you deal with this? Um, oh, that's, somebody knows that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's a, uh, my first paper was on the striatal neurons and I could tell you the output of the striatal neurons from mouse every week, I done the four weeks to six weeks old mice, and every week it was decreasing. Uh, neurons are really sticky cells, so they are adhered so strongly, and until dissociating, you actually activate a lot of genes if you are doing a live dissociation. So, because you need to cut the connections and then isolate the cell. So, Part of the reason we talk about a lot of you hear about single cell technologies in the microglia immune cells, they are not adhering cells. So when you gently shake them, they just uh, they don't die. They you can isolate them much more effectively. So the field of the immunology is increasing partially because the ease of the analyzing these cells and they are quite fun cells to work with. Neurons. Uh, I, we have developed one of the best protocols to isolate them and it's not good enough because it, they go through a lot and we use transcriptional inhibitors to block the transcriptional responses to dissociation because we have 30, 40 minutes, uh, 37 centigrade treatments. It helps, but it doesn't erase it. Uh, the one, it, advance we are having right now is a single nuclear sequencing. Instead of a single cell, we freeze the brain and just isolate the nuclei and look to what remains there. It is, quality is lower, but 
you don't have these technical challenges of isolating and eliminating cell types. So uh, we are right now in a massive explosion of single nuclear sequencing. And the question is perfect because it's, we didn't really solve the dissociating single neurons. And instead of that, we go, we isolate the nuclei and uh, sequence to whatever left in nuclei. Okay. Um, and then the second question too is um, how can you use um, single cell rna seq in an evolutionary uh, context, so comparative transcriptomics? Um, and uh, also seeing recent updates on wet lab and analysis pipelines, do you have any plans to focus on this side as well? Uh, what was the second question? Because I was with the evolution, comparative biology was good enough question. I <laughs> kind yeah, of yeah. lost that. Yeah, so they, they added in, in the context of uh, uh, recent updates on wet lab and analysis pipelines as well. But I guess in general, yeah, how do you use Yeah, that, uh, um, actually there are, Mm. So the uh, single cell genomics. One thing, uh, one great example was just recently came uh, uh, from um, uh, its cell paper. They compare microglia from different species, from whale to human, uh, mouse, and uh, birds and immune cells in the birds. So, and then they see how these immune cells in the brain, different uh, species react uh, their transcriptional responses to alter. And you see some of the marker genes on certain evolutionary uh, branches grouped together. And then you started to, they didn't go after which diseases on these branches to affect, but I think that would be the second thing. If you look to the cell types across the different uh, species and then see maybe when you compare uh, these sharks uh, that live 300 years uh, in the Antarctic, uh, probably their neurons and their brain cell types could hold clues about the differences and if we don't have the single cell data from that shark but that could be uh, interesting people using the naked mole rats for that reason so the how these naked mole rats uh, because they don't feel pain they don't get very much cancer uh, they are neurodeg neuronal responses hypoxia responses amazing which means that in a stroke case if we can understand what the factors they use to protect, we can use that into the uh, protection. Similarly, there are, I've seen some data, it's not published yet, but uh, hibernation is a beautiful mechanism. And hibernating animals, what kind of evolutionary mechanisms and single cell, which cell types drive that single cell is the right way to go, to analyze that. And from this comparative analysis, you interesting mechanisms you capture and these are potential treatments that 10 years ahead right but we need i guess more uh to isolate more cells for more species to do these uh... well you don't really because the community is really sharing most of our research is before starting with a student project nearly 30 percent 40 percent of the project has been available online Okay. So you just collect those. Yeah. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, okay. I think this was uh, the last question because uh, we are a little bit over time, but uh, it was a really interesting discussion. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Also, people in the comments are saying this is really interesting. Um, so um, thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you very much. See you next time. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.